Welcome to the Crawford Prize Symposium in Geosciences. And the theme of today's symposium is the evolution of life on Earth through deep time. My name is Hans Ellegren. I'm Secretary General of the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences. And it is the Academy who organizes this uh, symposium. We have an organizing committee. Uh, I would like to take the opportunity directly to thank the members of the committee, Martin Jakobsson and many others, Graham Budd, I just met up there. Uh, there will be quite an exciting symposium today. Uh, I see from the, the, the mix of, of people here in the audience that it has attracted the many different uh, disciplines, so to, so to say. And the basic theme of the symposium is evolution. And evolution is such a fascinating thing. Uh, when we go to Lund this time of the year, I think uh, at least those of us who come from the north, we are thrilled by all the beautiful uh, flowers we can see. Uh, how they flourish on, on, on the plants, on, on the bushes, on, uh, on trees. When we walk here in town, if we will go outside town, uh, some of us who are interested in birds would find very many birds and very many different species of birds. What we see is uh, biodiversity. And biodiversity comes about through evolution. And we see even uh, biodiversity here, although it's, yeah, I think, just one species. Oh, no, there are several species. Are, are these real? Yeah, yeah. Then we have uh, more than one species, but still there is biodiversity among us. Uh, we look a bit different, in fact. Paradoxically, uh, this fascinating diversity uh, has not come about by there being some particular direction in evolution, nor is there any meaning of evolution. And that's a bit of a paradox. Uh, it just happens. And evolution is in fact just a consequence of a few facts in nature. If the resources for survival and reproduction are limited such that everyone cannot survive and reproduce. And if there is variation in those traits that govern the ability to reproduce and to survive. And if those traits are genetically inherited, then there will be evolution. It's just a consequence of these basic facts in nature. We don't have, need to have a theory of evolution, because evolution just happens as a consequence. Uh, we can study evolution in many different ways. Uh, we can use mathematics or, or modeling to sort of predict evolution in the future. We can study ongoing evolution. Uh, my ecologist colleagues here in Lund, they study damselflies or, or, or other organisms. They go out in nature and do experiments. We can be in the lab to use uh, fruit flies or uh, small nematodes or uh, yeast just to study evolution when it happens. And then we can do experiments to see how different uh, changes in conditions uh, changes evolution. We can also study evolution backwards in time. And uh, for people like myself, who is sort of an uh, evolutionary genomicist, we can use DNA sequence data to compare different species and draw inference about how evolution happened maybe some or many million years ago back. But there is a li limit on how far we can go back using genetic data. Because when evolution began, and for the vast majority of time there had been evolution for the first uh, two billion years or so, uh, we, we don't have anything left from those organisms than fossils. And even the smallest organisms uh, leave traces as fossils. And the theme of today's symposium is to sort of discuss how we can sort of uh, make inference about the first steps of evolution with the smallest kind of organisms, uh, how life came about in the first place and how it evolved uh, during the first maybe one or two billion years or so. Again, this is the theme uh, of uh, the symposium, and it's also the theme of the research of, the, of this year's Crawford Prize winner, Andrew Null. And we will uh, 
come to hear a presentation of Andrew in a couple of minutes here. Um, and of course, Andrew will open today's symposium and set the stage for the scientific excellence uh, that will be manifested uh, by many prominent speakers here today. I would like to end uh, by saying that there is a reason that we are here and that uh, the Royal Swedish Academy of Sciences have the, the very fortunate possibility to award the Crawford Prize. And that is thanks to a donation by the late Holger Crawford, who lived here in Lund. He was a businessman and uh, he was involved in, in many different areas and in particular he made or his company Gambro made a fortune from uh, dialysis uh, apparatus and techniques uh, used in the kidney uh, clinics. And uh, he donated a large sum of money to different kinds of research. Here in Lund we have the Crawford Foundation who sponsor research of different kinds. But also, he made contact with the Royal Swedish Academy with a very big donation to allow uh, awarding the Crawford Prize. And we have, thanks to his um, uh, will, uh, Crawford Prize is in five different areas. It's in uh, astronomy, in uh, biosciences, in geosciences, in mathematics, and in polyarthritis, and the latter is related to his own health issues. And it's also thanks to that donation that we can organize symposia like this. And this is clearly one of the aim of the academy. Academy, first to sort of award excellence in research, but also to provide a meeting place for uh, discussing science. So again, uh, very welcome to this symposium. I hope you will have a great time here today. And by that, I leave the word to Martin Jakobsson. Thank you, Hans. <clears throat> See if I come up with my next one, my first slide. Okay, dear laureate and ladies and gentlemen and distinguished speakers, I got the honor today to open this uh, session and introduce uh, Andrew Noll. And uh, I will do so by first saying a few words about geoscience, which Hans said, these are the different prize categories we have, mathematics, astronomy, geosciences, biosciences, and polyarthritis. And I don't know the, the width of the audience here, but I think I always take the time to say a few words about geoscience. So geoscience is a very, very, very broad field. It enc encompasses the hydrosphere, the atmosphere, the biosphere, and the geosphere, which is the solid part of the Earth. We sometimes argue about this, uh, these spheres, which one should be actually in geoscience. And if you look at underneath every sphere, sp sphere it branches out into a ton of subjects. And I think one of the remarkable things with the geoscience is that we do try to connect it together. And uh, there is a particular field here, which is called geobiology. And geobiology connected, connects the biosphere and the geosphere in a very specific way. It looks at the evolution of life, as Hans mentioned. And this is the particular field which we believe that Andrew Noll has moved significantly forward. So <coughs> I should... The prize this year is in geosciences, but it actually goes into geobiology. So we kind of cross in between biosciences here and geosciences. Andrew Noll, Fisher Professor of Natural History and Professor of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Harvard University. We do give the prize for fundamental contributions of our understanding of the first three billion years of life on Earth and life's interactions with the physical environment through time. So this is the long sentence that we award the prize for. I learned yesterday, and I was very pleased to hear, that Andrew, as many, of, many of us, didn't know what to do when he went to university. <laughs> so he, he took one course in biosciences, you have to correct me if I'm wrong, and another course in earth sciences, and just to see what they were, these fields were like. And you turned out to like both. <laughs>
And I couldn't help by thinking this must be this is a fantastic setting for geobiology. <laughs> and then it became geobiology, which you really have moved forward. Andrew work in address research questions about evolution life and its environment through geological time. He studied microscopic fossils and organisms as far back as three billion years. And he do that by looking at or taking samples from rock outcrops. There's a lot of microscopic analysis, working on geochemical proxies such as isotopes, etc. I also learned yesterday that you go to specific places like Spitsbergen to find these out outcrops, an area which I'm extremely intrigued about. Uh, you created a holistic picture by integrating all available data. This is a fundamentally important thing, integrating all these different data, geological, biological and chemical, to make a holistic view. Null discovery of microscopic fossils that date back more than three billion years and his pioneering work to understand the interaction of Earth over subsequent eons has really moved this geological field forward. One of the f he was one of the first to apply carbon isotopes to understand how much organic matter carbon was preserved in rock during Earth's early history. He also provided an explanation for the largest mass extinction event in the end of the Permian 252 million years ago, uh, when more than 90% of marine species disappeared and 70% of land animals. And we can read in these really intriguing papers that it was most likely due to climate warming, massive climate warming, and extraordinary high carbon dioxide levels. So this is something, I don't think we have talked so much about these earlier extinctions in the context of, of climate change today. So I certainly, who work with the present conditions, are definitely going to go all the way back and read again and again Andrew Knoll's work. Part of his research has been to help NASA to analyze geological findings in form of data and images from Mars also learned very recently that you were the first geologist ever to make a cross section of an extra planet <laughs> of a stratigraphic section from mars or from a planet away from earth that's correct and i think that's that's a fascinating thing in itself so with that i will hand over to you and this is not the correct title because the title is fight to planting in space and time that we're going to hear a talk about. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Martin, for that very nice introduction. It's sometimes a little embarrassing at times like this because when you hear the introduction, it makes you sound like some cross between Hercules and St. Francis of Assisi. But in fact, I'm just a person who has always loved nature have been privileged to work on it, have been privileged to work on it with uh, uh, an amazing number of wonderful students and postdocs and good colleagues, many of whom you'll hear from from today. And so that's, that's that. Um, I did want to begin by expressing my sincere gratitude to both the Swedish Academy of Sciences and the Crawford Foundation for this remarkable honor. Um, to receive the Crawford is really beyond aspiration. And uh, I am grateful both for the recognition that I'm receiving as an individual, but also the recognition of the emergence of geobiology as a vibrant discipline, really along the interface between the life and, and earth sciences. So with that, and if I can find the, you don't still have a, <laughs> yeah. You're probably not the only person in the audience who would like to do that. <laughs> okay, I, I wasn't sure what I should talk about today because some of the later speakers, who I know very well, are going to talk about some things where I've had an interest and I wanted to avoid having too much overlap with them. So I decided I would talk about something that's been of interest to me for a long time, which is the photosynthetic biota. I've always been a person who was more interested in talking about the primary producers than the, than the consumers. Uh, I've done some work on the evolution of land plants, but today I want to talk about the evolution of phytoplankton, the small organisms that dominate primary production in the oceans. And there's a number of reasons for wanting to do this. First of all, I, I think it allows me to provide a framework that uh, 
will perhaps resonate, I hope, with the speakers you'll hear later in the day. And it also allows me to ruminate on some things that I've been thinking about for a long time. And the, the sort of framework for my thought is a sort of time-space correlation that I find intriguing and perhaps even useful. Uh, many of you know at least the rudiments of this diagram. It's simply a distribution diagram of chlorophyll A in surface seawater, chlorophyll A being a proxy for primary production uh, in the central gyres of the ocean basins. Uh, there are very few nutrients. Primary production levels are low. And then as you go, particularly around the margins of continents, high latitudes, you get to successively higher nutrient levels. Uh, and the interesting thing to me about that is that you can actually map the distribution of different phytoplankton groups onto that map. And what you see is uh, shown very nicely in this diagram from Mick Follow's lab at uh, MIT. Uh, on the x-axis, you simply have the total amount of chlorophyll A, so total primary production or nutrient levels. The y-axis is the amount of chlorophyll A for a given class of phytoplankton. And what you see is that at low nutrient levels, most of the primary production is by very small cells, read cyanobacteria. As you increase nutrient levels, they increase, but only for a certain amount, and then they level off and actually go down. At the same time, mid-sized plankton, green algae, for example, are not that important at very low nutrient levels, but become important as nutrient levels increase. And then they level off as well. And only at high nutrient levels do you see major primary production by the larger plankton reed diatoms. So there is a spatial correlation between the types of primary producers and the nutrient levels uh, in the seawater they inhabit. And I found that interesting because if you look through time at the history of primary producers, uh, for most of Earth history, primary production was done by cyanobacteria and other uh, photosynthetic bacteria. Only near the end of the Proterozoic era do we seem to have the ecological emergence of green phytoplankton, and they're important uh, through Paleozoic oceans. And then really only in the Mesozoic do we have the advent of the major so-called chlorophyll A plus C phytoplankton that are important on continental shelves today, dinoflagellates, coccolithophorids, and then later diatoms. And so it strikes me that this correlation or at least resonance between the spatial nutrient dependent distribution of plankton in today's oceans and their geologic distribution through time might actually be trying to tell us something. So I'm going to ruminate on three uh, issues. Uh, I'll have some thoughts. I'm sure there are people who have, have other thoughts. And I must say, when you get old and have this prize, you don't have to worry anymore about what people think about what you're saying. So the first one I want to talk about is the nature of primary production on the early Earth during the Archean. Uh, to what extent were cyanobacteria present? And to what extent were they important primary producers? And in any event, what tipped the balance towards cyanobacteria that is recorded by the great oxygenation event 2.4 to 2.2 billion years ago? Then I'll talk a little bit about uh, an issue that has come to the fore more recently, in, in no small part due to uh, biogeochemical work by I'm proud to say a former postdoc of mine, Jochen Brox. And that is, why do eukaryotic phytoplankton become ecologically important relatively late in the evolutionary day? And what might be some of the ecosystem consequences of that? And then another issue that's excited me over the years, which is how can we understand this relatively recent radiation of chlorophyll A plus C phytoplankton and what would be some of the biogeochemical and ecosystem consequences of that? So let's start out with the Archean, and we might ask to begin with, was there 
phytoplankton, was it? Were there primary producers in the water column? And I think just the distribution of organic carbon suggests the answer is yes. What you're looking at here are a series of drill cores from a project we did in uh, Southern Africa some years ago. These are from basinal uh, sediments of the so-called Transvaal supergroup. These rocks are about 2.6 billion years old. You can see that they are quite rich in organic matter. Uh, Nick Bucus in South Africa has actually reconstructed this basin palynspastically, and he would argue that these sediments accumulated beneath as much as 600 meters worth of water. There are certainly error bars on that, but without question, these sediments accumulated below the photic zone. And so the organic matter here, and I think in many other basins of Archean age, at least brings me to think that phytoplankton was part of the primary producers. So if that's the case, were cyanobacteria part of this phytoplankton? If so, what role did they play? If not, uh, what can we say about that? Um, as many of you know, uh, geochemical evidence that Don Canfield is here has played a major role in helping us to understand suggests that uh, there was very little, if any, permanent global accumulation of oxygen gas in the atmosphere and surface oceans before the so-called Great Oxygenation event, about beginning about 2.4 billion years ago, and that that resulted in the permanent oxygenation of at least the atmosphere and surface ocean. And that really sets a minimum date for the evolution of oxygenic cyanobacteria, because there really isn't another process that's capable of generating oxygen in the quantities required to oxygenate the planet. But there are certainly some lines of evidence that would suggest that cyanobacteria evolved significantly earlier. On the left, whoops, on the left, you'll see a um, molecular clock. There's a number of these. This is a recent one from Greg Fournier and his colleagues at MIT. I know you can't read this, and all you really need to know is that all of the green lines are crown group cyanobacteria. So in this, uh, in, in, in this molecular phylogeny, and in fact, in, in most, but not all, published molecular phylogenies, the suggestion is that cyanobacteria as a physiological and phylogenetic type predate the, the GOE. Um, there are also, I'll talk about this a little bit more in a second, uh, a number of geochemical markers in Archean rocks that have been interpreted uh, as indicators of at least transient and local to region, regional oxygen accumulation before the GOE, which again would be an argument in favor of an earlier cyanobacterial origin. So just a f few more comments on the question of whether cyanobacteria were present or absent. As I said, there's, there's really something on the order of nearly three dozen geochemical records now that have been interpreted on the basis of redox-sensitive uh, elements and, and, and isotopes, supporting this idea of these transient whiffs of oxygen uh, in the Archean. Some, in fact, one very recently have been called into question that the idea that the uh, oxidation of these sediments could be a later diagenetic event. Uh, that may well be true. Um, of course, it needs to be true for every one of them to really refute the idea that there were cyanobacteria beforehand. So that's a work in progress. Uh, another thing that I think makes me at least a little concerned about the cyanobacteria as you know, environmental magic wand hypothesis is that even today, in water bodies where there are alternative electron donors, cyanobacteria don't do that well. So it's not clear to me that simply by evolving the ability to use water as an electron donor, that that makes the GOE uh, immediately inevitable. There are people like Roger Buick, actually my first postdoc, who had, has done some very nice work on lacustrine stromatolites in Archean, uh, successions. These are some beautiful stromatolites interpreted as lake stromatolites from uh, 2.7 billion years old in, in Western Australia. And Roger made, I think, the very good point that there is no chemical evidence in these rocks for the availability of alternative um, 
electron donors, which almost requires by default that you look toward primary producers that can get their electrons from water. And then uh, in fight from Don Canfield's lab, a paper by Jones et al. a few years ago that I think is really very helpful, has been helpful to me in thinking about how we might find some resolution, uh, has to do with the conditions under which oxygenic cyanobacteria versus anoxygenic photosynthetic bacteria will be ecologically more prominent in the oceans. And the argument goes something like this, that if you have alternative electron donors, and Don's group talked about ferrous iron, since that is expected to be the numerically most abundant electro uh, alternative electron donor in Archean oceans, they're going to set, you know, make it possible to have anoxygenic photosynthesis. Phosphate or phosphorus abundance will essentially set the amount of primary production. And the argument kind of goes that if you, in the process of photosynthetic depletion of these materials, if you run out of phosphate before you run out of alternative electron donors, anoxic photosynthetic bacteria will predominate and cyanobacteria will not gain ecological prominence. Once you tip the scale so that you run out of uh, electron donors before you run out of phosphate, then the world is safe for cyanobacteria. And I find that a very useful framework for thinking about how to accommodate molecular clocks, whiffs of oxygen in the GOE. Now, just a little bit more on uh, levels of primary production. Uh, and one of the things that's becoming a, a prominent theme in geological work on the Archean now is that it was just physically a very different world from ours. There's reason to believe that for most of the Archean, Earth was kind of a water world. That yes, you had emergent volcanoes and maybe some small land masses, but essentially we did not have widespread emergence of large cratonic areas. Why would that be true? Uh, there are several uh, arguments, and they all have to do with there being a warmer mantle in the Archean, which almost has to be true since it has been dissipating heat uh, through, its, through the entire history of the Earth. And the way the argument goes, in a hotter mantle, as my colleague Rebecca Fisher has, has argued, it's very hard for the mantle to hold on to water. So most of the water in the mantle would be degassed, and the water that's in the mantle today has actually been returned to the mantle as it cooled through subduction. Now, it's believed that there is a minimum of an ocean's worth of water in the mantle today. So if most of that was degassed early on, add another ocean, ocean's worth of water to the surface, and even with today's hypsometry, you would not have much in the way of emergent land. Coupled with that, it appears to be physically the case that in a hotter mantle, that mantle is not capable of supporting buoyant crust the way today's mantle is. So that would be another argument why you would not have strongly emergent continents. And so the two of them together suggest that it may have been a very different, different world. That, of course, would limit weathering and erosional fluxes of, of uh, phosphorus into the oceans. And I'll talk about this a little more in in, in a bit, but because there was not only no oxygen, but limited supplies of oxidants uh, in the oceans, as Eva Stuyken has argued, there would be fairly inefficient remineralization of organic matter. So actually the recycling of that phosphate would be somewhat inhibited. And also as Lou Derry has, has argued in the past, as we see happening actually in, in parts of the Baltic Sea today, that the presence of ferrous iron in solution would result in a reactivity with phosphorus that would precipitate some of this phosphorus out as minerals like vivianite, again, sort of limiting the recycling of phosphorus. On the right, you see uh, a little diagram from a paper that I was fortunate to work on with a very good young geochemist named Ji Tao Hao. And it, it actually puts together a number of inferences for primary production levels on, on the early Earth. Uh, here's one by Christian Bierum and, and Don Canfield, both of whom are in the room. Again, based on the idea that it was predominantly anoxygenic 
uh, photosynthesis and the idea that you had 10% or less of modern levels of primary production has to do with the availability of alternative electron donors. Uh, Lewis Ward, who is actually my undergraduate advisee, uh, has made somewhat lower estimates more recently. And the two red lines that you see are two models that Jital put together based on early and later models for the emergence of continental crust above sea level. Uh, and in this case, it turns out that phosphorus levels are low enough that, that in a sense, it, it's not that it doesn't matter who's doing the primary production, but total levels of primary production would be low enough that even if oxygenic photosynthesis was ecologically important, it would be going on at low enough rates that it would be hard to oxygenate the planet. And actually, with what we've learned in the last two years, I think I would actually push this over toward, toward the right, and because I think there's evidence not only for emergence of cratons, but actually growth of cratons in the last 200 million years of the Archean. And so if that's the case, then perhaps this late Archean to early Proterozoic emergence of cratonic areas might be something that tips the balance toward Fe to P ratios that uh, would support cyanobacteria as ecologically important organisms. Again, one would expect that ferrous iron coming out in hydrothermal solutions should actually decline as mantle temperatures decline. P should increase as you have uh, continental weathering and, and erosion increase. So again, perhaps the GOE, which certainly requires a biological component, oxygenic photosynthesis, is also there's an important interaction between that and the physical Earth. OK, so how much oxygen do we think actually came into the atmosphere during the, the Paleoproterozoic? Uh, this is a pretty famous cartoon by now by Tim Lyons and his colleagues. Uh, I think most people would subscribe to this kind of three-part history of oxygen in the atmosphere, uh, basically none some and lots. Um, and so this suggests that when the GOE was over, we did not have modern levels of oxygen in the oceans, but somewhere, depending on your model, between 1 and 10 percent. I'd also say that this is a cartoon in that there's absolutely no variation through time. I think there's reason to believe that there may have been some up and down movement. But basically, I think I at least subscribe to the idea that when the GOE was over, we still have a interesting intermediate level of oxygen in which the, uh, the deep oceans remained largely anoxic and ferruginous. And only around 600 million years ago do we see the beginnings of the climb to the relatively high oxygen levels we see today. And I also point to this cartoon because it will be something that's important in uh, uh, the, the things I'm going to say next. This is a cartoon based after some work of Philip Froelich uh, years ago in trying to understand the phosphorus cycle in the oceans today. And the burden of this argument is that if you want to know where does all the phosphorus come from that is, you know, really charging the primary production of phytoplankton in continental shells, most of it does not come from weathering and erosion, most of it comes from the upwelling of remineralized materials. And so what I'm suggesting, and we can certainly discuss later, is that at the GOE, this component is reaching something like modern values, whereas this component, because of limited oxidants, Fe2 in the oceans and that, is still much, much smaller than we see today. And then this is just a, a, a little more explanation of that. This is just a diagram of what the oceans might have looked like from Hood and Wallace a few years ago. Uh, we can argue whether the surface ocean in mid-ocean gyres was entirely anoxic, but it basically suggests that for much of the Proterozoic, things that Don and others have worked on for years, you have oxygen in nearshore environments and in the surface mixed layer, but beneath that you had anoxic waters that commonly, at least, were, were ferruginous. Um, 
Now, what's interesting today, you know, people my age grew up with some really interesting papers by von Capella and Engel and others that suggest that under anoxic conditions, you actually have preferential remineralization of organic matter that frees up phosphorus. So you'd think maybe in anoxic waters, you would actually have a larger remineralization effect. But that's only true when you have high sulfate oceans, which is probably not the case for most of Earth's history. That in ferruginous oceans, as I said, people like Lou Derry have argued that you can precipitate iron phosphates as vivinite. Uh, you can have phosphate absorbed on uh, iron oxides. You can have precipitation of appetite, all of which would limit that uh, upwelling remineralization. And as this paper by Kip and Strieken argued, I think compellingly, that when oxygen levels are low, sulfate levels are low, nitrate levels are low, the amount of oxidants will again limit remineralization. This is just some work from Tom Laxo, who was a postdoc uh, that I had a, a chance to work with. And it basically says that when you have uh, high levels of oxidants, you end up ha having uh, high levels of burial efficiency of organic carbon and low levels of remineralization. And when you get over this way, here's the Black Sea today, where abundant sulfate means you have fairly high levels of remineralization. So again, the ability of upwelling to supply large amounts of phosphate is itself related to the uh, physical and chemical structure of the oceans. OK, well, let's move on. Uh, one of the major biological changes uh, that accompanies the Proterozoic Aeon is the emergence of eukaryotic cells. Uh, we have evidence back through 1,600 to 1,800 million year old rocks of the presence of eukaryotic organisms. Difficult to know how to place them phylogenetically within the eukaryotes, if indeed they're crown group organisms. But I think many of them have properties that uh, allow us to call them eukaryotic with some, some uh, confidence. This is just from some work of Emmanuel Javot in Belgium, who Again, I'm going to keep telling you that all these people are my students and postdocs. I'm very proud of them, and it's the reason I'm here today, because of them. Uh, Emmanuel ha has done and continues to do wonderful work on these things. And also through the work of two people who are in the audience today, we have reason to believe that there were photosynthetic uh, eukaryotes a billion years ago or more. Uh, here, some beautiful work by Nick Butterfield on early red algae in uh, 1045, what, plus or minus 3 million year old rocks from northern Canada. Recently, Shuhai Shao has shown in rocks that are of the order of a billion years that there are uh, fossils that I think he's interpreted correctly as, as green algal. So we do have, through the Proterozoic, not only the emergence of a new cell type, but through originally a symbiotic association with cyanobacteria, the emergence of photosynthetic uh, eukaryotes. Now, that's interest, interesting in light of some fairly recent work from the, la the lab of Jochen Brox, who has sort of systematically sampled organic-rich sediments through the later Proterozoic and, and Paleozoic. And this is a nice diagram from a paper a few years ago where these are different samples they looked at in rocks that are older than 645 million years old. Uh, Green says that you find some steranes, which are the geologically uh, uh, preservable uh, derivatives of sterols, but no nothing that you could assign to phytoplankton. There's one sample in rocks that are of the order of 635 to 600 million years ago. That is the early Ediacaran on the heels of uh, large-scale ice ages. One sample has stigma sterane, which is a, a green algal uh, sterane. By the time you get to 600 to 560 million years ago, all the samples basically are green algal rich, and that continues through the Paleozoic. So, it appears from this record that however early photosynthesis came to the eukaryotes, that it is late in the Proterozoic when we first start seeing biogeochemical evidence for the ecological importance 
of green algae. And that's actually interesting because if one looks at the microfossil record, uh, I would think, and I'd be interested in, in uh, Susanna's opinion in particular, that the first time I see things that I think I can reliably call presnophyte green algae, which are the major uh, phytoplankton green algae today, is actually in, in Ediacaran rocks. So there's an interesting question there of evolutionary origin versus rise to ecological prominence in certain environments. And I'm going to go back to phosphates. Uh, phosphates have been very good to me. Uh, this is a picture of the Doshanto phosphorus, phosphorite in uh, China. Uh, there's some dates that place this a little, maybe a little older than 600 million years and going upward from there. This person that you see in the lower left is the late Zhang Yung, who was Xu Hai's uh, advisor in the university and was a dear friend and colleague of mine. Uh, we and Xu Hai continually have been privileged to work with our Chinese colleagues on this because it's a treasure trove of paleontological data. But I'm interested in the phenomenon of phosphorites for the purposes of this lecture. And that is, there are phosphorites found throughout the Proterozoic Eon, but they tend to be relatively limited in volume. And in fact, there is more phosphate in the Doshanto formation alone than in all phosphates found in all older rocks on Earth. And as you can see in this little diagram here, that beginning at about the time when green algae become ecologically important, there's a state shift in the abundance of ore grade phosph phosphorites, and that continues through the Phanerozoic. So maybe, maybe we're seeing uh, something that resonates with the spatial distribution that we saw, maybe there is uh, more nutrients coming into the system that will support eukaryotic rather than st strictly prokaryotic uh, phytoplankton. Well, what may have happened at that time? There is something called the Pan-African orogeny, which you see a series of orogenies during continental aggregation about this time. Uh, this is thought by many to have produced the largest mountains that the Earth has ever seen. Uh, you can see here in the strontium isotope curve, which in very simple terms, the higher numbers tend to reflect contributions of weathering and erosion of continents to seawater. Lower numbers tend to represent proportional uh, input from hydrothermal systems. And in particular, if you, uh, Graham Shields some years ago actually normalized this for mantle evolution, and you can see this unfortunately got out of place, but here's what's going on about 600 million years ago. It's kind of an all-time peak in the strontium isotope curve, which might suggest that we have some increase in uh, phosphate coming into the oceans. Now, an increase in continental runoff, maybe you could double the amount of phosphorus coming into the oceans, but if you could stimulate somehow this remineralization loop, an upwelling loop, you could increase phosphate by uh, an order of magnitude or more. And what we have argued in, in the past is that what you really need is something that takes you to a new steady state. And a one possible argument that we've made is that you do get a transient increase in phosphate coming into the oceans because of the weathering of these trans African mountains. You would also have an increase in, in sulfate from the weathering of sulfide, pyrite in rocks that are being weathering and eroded. Because of that increase in oxidants, you would increase remineralization efficiency, and that would lead more phosphate to come back up to the surface, which would lead to higher levels of primary production, which would lead to more oxidants. And with that positive feedback, you might be able to get yourself to a new steady state. And so, one way or another, as many people have argued, there does seem to be uh, a change in the redox properties of the oceans about this time as we start building toward uh, modern levels of oxygen. And it is interesting, too, that when you look at the sort of ecosystem consequences of uh, having higher primary production and larger algae, this is from a little model that uh, was in a paper that I wrote with Mick Follows 
a few years ago. Again, this is nutrient abundance. This is biomass. You start out with little cells. You add bigger cells. You add bigger cells. You add bigger cells among the photoautotrophs. And as you do that, the amount of biomass of heterotrophs grows. And so the argument here would be that the other thing we see on this time scale is the first large animals. And perhaps it is this framework of more food and more oxygen that uh, facilitates this, uh, this event. This is just some, some nice work by Jennifer Hoyle Cuthill. And these are her, her uh, virtual ediocrines. And Jen made the argument that the growth series that you see in ediocrine organisms reflects adaptations to a larger food supply. So a possibility. OK, just to finish off then, the last and in some ways greatest of the phytoplankton events uh, in the Mesozoic, you have the coccolithophorids, about which Roz Rickaby in the audience knows much more than I do. And you can see they first start to see them in the Triassic, and they rise through time. Dinoflagellates, about half of which are photosynthetic, become important members of the uh, phytoplankton on about that same time scale. And diatoms, which are dominant organisms in many nutrient-rich environments today, come in a, a little bit later. And interestingly, if you look at the biomarker molecular record, it gives about the same time scale for the emergence of these groups as ecologically important organisms. Now, why did that happen? Now, here there's a lot of uh, ideas. Uh, some years ago, Antonietta Quigg and her colleagues, this is from Paul Falkowski's lab, argued that because green algae and cyanobacteria have a larger iron quotient than chlorophyll A plus C uh, photosynthetic organisms, that maybe the drop in, in iron would favor these other groups. And that's at least interesting. Uh, interestingly resonating with a paper that uh, Roz led a, few, uh, a year or two ago, in which suggested that the sort of complete permanent full oxygenation of the water column only happens on the same time scale that we start to see these chlorophyll A plus C organisms. A paper that I participated in with, in the lab of the late Mario Giordano uh, was that you know, as sulfate goes up, we did experiments, we being uh, Simona Roddy, uh, where she grew different phytoplankton uh, species at varying levels of sulfate. And green algae and cyanobacteria, which have low sulfur quotients, they don't care. They can grow in all these things. The chlorophyll A plus C algae do not grow well at low sulfate uh, uh, treatments. And so therefore, increasing sulfate as we go into the Mesozoic could have been important. Again, Roz wrote a nice paper on rubisco evolution and the idea that particularly in groups like diatoms, you have forms of rubisco, the enzyme that uh, fixes CO2 and unfortunately has a high propensity to fix oxygen, uh, will work better than other rubiscos in a world where CO2 is going down and oxygen is going up. Uh, there's no shortage of specific structural and metabolic adaptations that have been suggested. Some nice papers by Vivi Kustra et al. and Chris Bowler et al. on these. And just the timing of this, this is something that Clitty Grice might be able to weigh in on, suggests that perhaps the extinctions at the end of the Permian may have created conditions where new groups that are incorporating plastids might become important. Now, it seems to me that any or all of these could be true. Uh, they're certainly not mutually exclusive, but it's also good to remember that that relationship between phytoplankton types and nutrients still holds. And I think that is an important uh, suggestion. Now, I want to say just a few words about the biogeochemical consequences and then the evolutionary consequences of this phytoplankton radiation, whatever its causes. Uh, I threw in some biogeochemical things, mostly for Daniel Connolly, because he's really done a lot of work on the silica cycle. Um, I got interested in this 
back in the late 1980s, there was a student in my friend Ray Siever's lab named Bob Maliva, who was working on the formation of early diagenetic chert nodules in Paleozoic limestones. And Bob came over and just gave me a rundown of what he had been observing and what he was thinking. And I found this fascinating because all the conclusions he was drawing about the facies and the timing of these uh, silica nodule events were totally different from everything I had concluded from my work on the Proterozoic. And so we ended up just sitting down for a couple of weeks, looking at each other's material, and we realized we were both right for our time periods. That what I was seeing, and here you see just some early diagenetic silica nodules in carbonates from the late Mesoproterozoic Alamore formation in Texas. In the Proterozoic, where there are no silica precipitating organisms, chert tends to come out at the very edges of the oceans as though it were an early stage evaporite. Once you get into the Paleozoic, and there are things like radial area and siliceous sponges that are now important sinks for silica, you basically lose this kind of facies association, and the facies where you find chert reflect the distributions of the organisms that biomineralize them. These are just some uh, basinal Ordovician cherts from Newfoundland that uh, really reflect radiolarian uh, conditions. Now, a number of people have tried to quantify silica levels through time. First, Ray Siever uh, in the 1990s, who said, well, you know, you really have uh, just about saturation with respect to amorphous silica before you have skeletons that use silica. Once you get radial area and, and sponges, levels go down. And then once you get diatoms, you go down to the very low levels seen today. And I think most people would agree that diatoms basically quantitatively remove silica from the oceans. More recently, right here in Lund, Daniel Connolly has uh, made some, some different arguments. Uh, suggesting that silica levels were lower than Ray suggested throughout history, but that the trajectory is pretty much the same. High before skeletons, it's reduced by uh, skeletons of radial area and, and sponges, and then reaches its current extremely low levels in most surface oceans uh, in concert with uh, diatom evolution. I do note there was a very recent paper by Lizzie Trower and colleagues using silicon isotopes to argue that uh, Paleozoic levels could have been a bit lower than uh, Daniel's argument, and that is, as they acknowledge in their paper, a model-dependent conclusion, but it's possible. But the important point is that organisms, and in particular diatoms, have had an important effect on the silica chemistry of the oceans. Now, one of the first papers I ever published as a graduate student. When I came to graduate school, the only research experience I had was as a summer fellow at the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, where I worked on Pleistocene radial area. And my office mate, a guy named Howard Harper, was interested in diatoms. So uh, being kind of young and fearless, we had dinner one night, a couple of beers, and then we started talking. And I realized there was a data set from Ted Moore that showed that the average silica abundance in radiolarian tests had declined through the Cenozoic. And Howard said, well, look, at the, this is what we think at that time the uh, diversity of diatoms was. Doesn't it look like as diatoms become important, radiolarians are using less silica because there's, there's less there. And so we uh, had the nerve to publish that. Um, since that time, there have been more sophisticated attempts to look at this issue, some nice work from Dave Lazarus and colleagues, who, which have shown, if you just look at silicification here through time, in tropical environments without question, silicification in radial area is declining through time. It declines less in high latitudes where upwelling increases silicon abundances. And then Ben Kotrich, who was the last graduate student in my lab and who actually did the bulk of this work in the Lazarus et al. paper, did an interesting thing where here you see the silicification through time in tropical waters as we see here. And then Ben looked at individual lineages of radial area. And what's interesting is that they're all over the map. There is no uniform radial area in 
uh, response. It's a species-specific response. So this central Botrys uh, lineage doesn't seem to notice that uh, silica, uh, others are using less silica. This Didymocertus lineage has kind of an interesting pattern that doesn't really reflect the overall uh, pattern. And then the Stichtochorus one sh it basically behaves itself in terms of what we might predict from the bulk radiolarian image. And the reason that this one is similar to the bulk value is that Stichtochorus is actually the dominant radiolarian in most of these assemblages. So individualistic responses, but something of a community response as well. Uh, diatoms themselves, there's some nice work by uh, Zoe Finkel, appear to decrease in size and silicon usage through time, uh, something that Zoe uh, suggested might reflect climate. I do point out that there was a recent paper by Sophie Westacott and colleagues at Yale who suggest that in part this decline in size might represent increasing preservation potential or smaller uh, diatoms are being preserved in younger successions. Uh, that may be the case, but there are implications for variance uh, in different ideas on why uh, this comes through time. And I think it is probably the case that indeed overall silicon usage per individual by diatoms is decreasing through time. Uh, a wonderful guy named Manuel Maldonado in Spain has done some interesting work where he took present-day deep-sea Mediterranean siliceous sponges and grew them at silicon levels that he thought were representative of Mesozoic seawater. And interestingly, they made spicule types that no one has seen in the geologic record since diatoms rose to, to prominence, which was interesting. Uh, Maldonado himself did argue, he says, well, everybody says there's no longer any uh, Siliceous sponges on the continental shelves, but I found one, you know, so that can't be true. And, and he's right, but statistically, there's siliceous sponges are much less important in shallow water environments than they were before the diatoms. Uh, I can guarantee you, if you spend time looking at thin sections of Paleozoic sediments, many of them are just wall to wall siliceous sponge spicules. That's not the case in the Cenozoic. And then some work that's just coming out now that I'm, I'm excited about. This is from the thesis of uh, Alessandra Petrucciani, who was Mario Giordano's final student. He sadly died before her work was completed, but I've been working with her, as have some other people, on experiments where she grew different diatoms. In this case, here are two centrics, two pennates, at different silicon levels, uh, 500, 225 representing what may have been some of the range of environments that diatoms saw. And this is, when you just look at the silicon content of cells, you can see that the centrics don't care. They don't care what the silica levels are, but the pennates really do, that their use of silica declines as silica availability declines. It's also the case that carbon isotope fractionation changes, uh, protein to lipid ratios change, uh, perhaps due to some of the energetics involved here. And so again, we see that some diatoms are f responding physiologically to different, uh, different uh, silicon levels, others are not. Okay, final thought. So what are the consequences if we have you know, perhaps more nutrients, larger phytoplankton cells. Uh, there's something, in fact, one of my favorite papers of all time, something called The Great Mesozoic Marine Revolution, a paper written by this gentleman, Gary Vermey, in the 1970s. Gary, as some of you will know, is a remarkable man. He, he went blind at age 10, and all his information on the morphology of living in fossil invertebrates is based on touch. But he made an interesting ecological observation years ago, which is that there are certain crabs that prey on a certain family of gastropods found in both the Western Pacific and the Caribbean. But in the Western Pacific, the crabs have significantly higher crushing strength in their claws. And in consequence, the shells are mechanically stronger in the Indo-Pacific gastropods than they are in their Caribbean counterparts. And Gary then took this insight and suggested that this happened in time. 
And certainly if you look at bivalves in Triassic or early Jurassic sediments, almost all the bivalves are sitting on, they're, they're, you know, they're epifaunal, they're just sitting on the sea surface. By the time you get to the Lake Cretaceous and Cenozoic, most bivalves are burrowing. You know, burrowing is an odd thing to do when you're a filter feeder, but if there are predators around, it's not a bad idea. And those that aren't uh, in faunal are either living in environments where, uh, from which their predators are excluded, like low salinity environments where oysters thrive or rocky intertidal zones where there are mussels, or there are things like scallops that can actually swim. If you've never seen a video of scallops swimming, it's worse. They're, they're the world's worst swimmers have this kind of flapping uh, uh, sort of jet propulsion. But as Jeremy Jackson and his students have shown, that significantly reduces predation on them. Same thing is true in echinoderms. There, there were plenty of sea urchins uh, uh, in the late Paleozoic and early Mesozoic, but through time they become mechanically stronger and more armored. In the Jurassic, there's actually a radiation of infaunal sea urchins, sand dollars, things like that. And those crinoids that persist in shallow water environments tend to be things that break their hold fast and swim. And then finally, in gastropods, again, as you go through time, Toward the present, you, they get mechanically stronger, they become armored. All of these suggest that there is an increased predation pressure. If you look at predators themselves, many of the major shell uh, imbibing uh, predators we see today evolve in the Mesozoic. You see these natissid burrows, natissid gastropods become common this time. Decapod crustaceans with strong crushing strength, uh, fish, uh, things like parrotfish become abundant. Some nice work by Huntley and Kowaleski showing that uh, actually drill holes and other uh, repair scars really go through the roof on this same time scale. And so the suggestion is that, you know, more nutrients, larger cells which pack more resource per cell, greater capacity to build carbon reserves, uh, and this and expanding primary production could actually provide the food web basis for the invertebrate and vertebrate changes that Gary Vermeer is seeing. Okay, so that's more than enough. I'll, I'll stop. The summary is that factually phytoplankton composition and productivity have changed through time in a way that recalls present day geographic patterns that this may at least in part reflect long-term evolution of the phosphorus cycle as influenced by evolving tectonics. And whatever the causes are, this has consequences not only for primary producers, but for ecosystems as a whole. So to all my uh, paleozoological friends in the audience, I would say if you want to understand the record of marine animal evolution, you have to understand the primary producers. And if you want to understand the primary producers, I think you have to embed them in physical earth history. And then finally, whether anything that I say is actually correct today, I do think that future research in these areas will require that we conduct integrated studies of the physical and biological earth system. So thank you very much. <laughs>